Behind the Shades. You made an interesting point because I experienced that a few years ago where when I was in a relationship during that time, it seemed like I became a pariah, right? Like people started like saying things about me, saying this stuff. And then I always, I, I, and then I went to them. I said, Saturday night doesn't have to be the only time you see your friends. It could mm-hmm. be a Monday, could be a Wednesday, could be a Sunday afternoon. And I remember I always, t- I told one of my friends, take away women, Will these, will these, this group of guys still be your friend? Meaning that will they still show up? Mm. And he's like, no, they don't. I was like, yes. I was like, women aren't the accessory you are. Because if I were to remove you, they would still go where the women are. But if I remove the women, they won't be where you are. Mm -hmm. All right. And the reason why I say this, because I know you mentioned that you had some friends that you know, put you in a difficult situation, like you mentioned, as well as they distance themselves from you. Did you, were you surprised that that happened to you? I was surprised, especially knowing the type of friend that I had been for them, you know, when they were in in serious situations where I was the only one they could turn to, um, I was there and, and basically helped with some serious things. And so I would think that these people would be happy for me because they knew my situation previously. They knew the person who I would, they both advised me to leave him alone for years. So when I finally do (laughs) and get with somebody who is treating me better and who wants to spend time with me and, and let me know that, Hey, I matter too in the relationship. Now it's a problem. So some people actually like you where you, where you are, where were they in, in the box they put you in. And as soon as you try to pop out that box, it's like whack-a-mole. You know, they want to bang you right back down into that hole, that pit. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's some people that (laughs) they rather they want you to be beneath them under their boots. Right. Mm -hmm. Like stay broke, stay single, stay can't figure it out, because the moment you begin to succeed, your competition. And that's what it was for this particular friend that told that non-truth about my husband. We would go places. And she would be the one to get all the attention. She was built very voluptuously. So she would get all the attention. And I think she liked it, but she didn't have a car. I had a car. So I was basically her transport to all of the parties and and, and to where she can get this attention that she was seeking that she didn't feel she was getting at home. Um, and so when, when her Uber uh, ride was over, you know, <laughs> basically she had to try to find a way to get her chauffeur and her benefactor, right? Because I was also the one paying our way to get into all these places. And granted, it's funny you mentioned accessory because the places we would go and the people would hang out with were people I would never hang out with, places I would never go had it not been for my best friend asking me to go. You know, it was like that. And so it's great that you put it that way. I'm like, I wouldn't hang, I wouldn't even be in these places had it not been for you. And so now she couldn't go either because I was her alibi or her friend with with the vehicle and the means to get in all these places. So yeah, she took issue with them. Like, oh no, I got to, I got to find a way to stop that. And she knew because she knew me so well, she knew what to say to, to make me second guess my situation because the way that we even met, we were dating the same guy. That's how we met. We became best friends. We were dating the same guy and found out about each other. And we said, Hey, we don't fight over boys. We were in high school. We don't fight over boys. And we became great friends. So she already knew that one of my triggers in relationship was monogamy. And so she knew that she used it against me. And I was like, oh, it almost worked. But no, I knew to ask him first. Not going to make that same mistake twice. And yeah, so we haven't spoken in years. <laughs> A few exes ago, I was dating someone and one of her friends told a story that I had a girlfriend in a different city where mm-hmm. that I am. And it was early on in a relationship, I want to say maybe two or three months. So, you know, this is a friend of a friend. So the trust and the belief of, and the authenticity of, of what they're saying is, is pretty high at this point, at least in comparison to what you believe I would say. And she mentioned it to me, but she didn't mention it to me the way you did, where it's like, okay, is this true? She mentions like, hey, this is what was said. Um, and she was like very upset about it. And one of the, my response was, well, I understand that you're upset, but if that is truly the case, let's put it to the test. I'm here. You're here. We're going to meet up later today. How about you tell your friend to tell this other person 
to call me while you're here and say that, yes, Terrain is my boyfriend, whatever. Mm -hmm. She's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. An hour later, they come back and they say that, oh, that person doesn't have my phone number. I was like, oh. But I'm their boyfriend. But I'm their boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then I took it a step further. I was like, okay, how about they give, how about fine? Maybe they've lost it or maybe they say that they don't want because of the drama. I was like, okay, ask them what my full name is. They should know my first and last name. And they right. didn't know that. So I was like, okay, now I'm not going to believe the story. Margot, mm -hmm. let me tell you this ultimate plot twist. And this was the start of my villain arc. She comes <laughs> back the next day. Text message now, long text message. How can you do this to me and all this other stuff? Even though I proved it wrong. And I wrote back and I was like, wow, this person doesn't know my name. They don't have my phone number. They don't know where I live, but yet I've been in a relationship for them for years. And you believe that. And I think it goes to your point where she was in a situation where someone cheated on her. And I think it was a trigger. So the friends knew exactly which button to press when they wanted mm -hmm. things to fall apart. What, how can someone, let's say you and I, who, or anyone who's listening, who maybe struggle with that type of trigger, but they want to make sure that they're thinking logically as well? Understand the psychology of confirmation bias. People are wired. Most of us, we we, will, we are willing to believe or more likely to believe anything that confirms how we already feel. That is a common thing. Um, people, this is why people don't make change so easily or we ask for advice and then don't take it when it goes against what we really want. So because these things already confirm what we've experienced, they confirm what we believe to be true, they confirm what we think could be the case, we're not really willing to accept a new paradigm, a new idea because it doesn't coincide with that mental shift. So what we need to do is focus on working on creating new neural pathways, basically accepting new ideas um, in the mind. And eventually, once you do it enough, your subconscious mind will begin to accept. And that is more powerful than our conscious mind. We need to understand that. What we see in front of us is only a manifestation of that, which is in our subconscious. So if we have lack in our life, it's because we have underlying limiting beliefs, even though we may say outwardly we have an abundance mindset. So when it comes to relationships, we have to maintain an abundance mindset, and that comes with eliminating confirmation bias. We, If we want change, we can't continue to look for things that confirm what we're trying to change from, and, and that's the hardest thing to do. It is the hardest on anyone's ascension journey <laughs> to change those habits, to create new neural pathways, but I'm telling you from experience, if you stick with it. Your life will change in ways you will never, you could never even dreamed. Damn. <laughs> it's like, it's like when you're going through someone's social media, someone's phone, you're like, aha, mm -hmm. I knew you liked that girl because you liked one of her videos or her picture. And like, you mm -hmm. see, I told you, right. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably as equally dangerous, especially now because it's online is such a big deal now, right? Like through social media, online yeah. dating where you can have someone in your mind your confirmation bias right thinking mm -hmm. i think my boyfriend is attracted to this person so you dig and you search and you search and if you find that one thing it justifies all your behavior in the present and anything that you do so if you key her car if you <laughs> <laughs> try to change a wi-fi password if you try to do all these crazy things you're like you're not mm -hmm. going to even interact with this girl anymore so when we are looking to find the success that you have had right because you had this situation it didn't work out you met someone else it worked out and now you're helping women what are some of the um common roadblocks that women face in dating today we need to learn and see ourselves as um, the best way I can put it is not not quite the commodity. We have to understand and see ourselves as a marketing thing uh, from a marketing perspective. Women love to shop. So I love to use shopping as an analogy. When men are choosing women and keep that in mind, men choose us. We don't choose them. When men are choosing women. Any in any type of marketing, most dollars are spent more on the packaging than the product. 
You can have the greatest product, but if your packaging, if your presentation is not up to standard, people are not really going to be interested in the product that's inside. So when men are looking for a wife, not not flavor of the week, you know, when they're looking for a wife or something long term, they are going to really, really hunker down on what's important to them. And one of the things that is most important, well, two of the things are our appearance and our level of cooperation. Those are the two things that men look at. Men are visual. Women are more emotional and men are more affected by what they see. Women are affected by what we hear, which is why as soon as somebody says something we don't like, here we go. You know, <laughs> whereas men, you like, he'd be like, man, shorty, look at that. You know, it's like, <laughs> and we're just like, oh, but then we also have to understand that we're wired differently and accept that we don't like it. I don't like it. You know, I'm a woman, you know, I'm not saying I'm not, but I've learned to accept the differences in how we're wired. So when women have issues in their relationships, a lot of times the common thing that I'm seeing is that he doesn't understand. He's not emotionally, you know, his emotional IQ is not quite there. You know, he wants to do this and all he wants is, is physical things and he, this and that. I'm like, yeah, he's a man. They're they're primal. You know, they <laughs> they want that. So and it's like and if you feel that you've been cheated on by someone, usually that person was maybe more visually appealing or more cooperative. Those are the two reasons that I noticed that men will step outside. And it's a lot of times we've been given a chance to correct these things, but we don't because we're so in our feelings. He doesn't like me as I am. This is how I am. This is how I am. This is... Okay, no. Again, we go back to marketing. In what store, what business is able to stay open that does not cater to its consumer? If you're going to a car dealership and you say, hey, I want an electric vehicle, and they keep showing you combustion engines, you know, the stuff that takes gas. You're like, you're not listening at all, but you want me to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars with you. And you're not even listening to the basic thing that I want. No, thank you. I'm going to go down here to Tesla, you know, where I know I can get an electric vehicle. We do the same thing to men. I want a woman who who looks pretty good, who takes care of herself and who can maybe not not nag me all day as soon as I come home for work. What do you mean to tell me? Are you saying I'm ugly? Are you saying that I'm out of shape? Are you saying that, that what I want doesn't matter? It's, it's the same thing. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go down here to this place with more agreeable, more attractive women because you clearly aren't even willing to cater to, to, to your customer. So find yourself a customer that wants to buy what you're selling because I'm not the one. And we get mad. Our customers tell us what, what they want. And that's why you see places that were just chicken restaurants now selling burgers. You know, they. You're, I'm sure you've been to a restaurant like, wait, tacos at breakfast tacos at mcdonald's like that type of stuff it's like you are a burger joint like but it's like well if the market is asking for this we want to be competitive we have to shift our business model because we know it's either sink or swim and women seem to not understand how to accept that so i use the dented can analogy if you're shopping in a grocery store and you see some soup same soup apples to apples one of the cans is dented and the label is hanging off. And then the other can is in pristine condition. But the product is the same. And it's the same price. I'm going for the better looking can. Because why not? You know, this, you know, because I can. The same thing is with men. Women outnumber men significantly. So men have the option of choice. Anytime a product outnumbers its consumer, the consumer has the advantage. And women, we keep thinking that we're the prize and we're what needs to be said. No, honey, we have to be competitive. We have to make sure that our can has as many dings knocked out of it as possible. Make sure that we are marketable. Make sure that we're like, hey, when you get me home, I'm going to give you exactly what you came to the store for. You're going to wish you you're going to wish you met me sooner. You know, we have to have that enthusiasm. And we lose that a lot of times. And like my thing is we have to be like the puppy in the window. We got to be happy to see him when he comes in, tails wagging. Like, I've actually been told to calm down because I'm basically got chilly. I'm like, hey, you're home. It's you. It's you. <laughs> but that's how men should be made to feel because I'm expecting you to protect me. I'm expecting you to provide for me. I'm expecting you to give me advice. I'm expecting you to basically, I know that you, you know, for, uh, you forewent several women to get to me because you got more choices than I have. So heck yeah, I'm about to be your biggest cheerleader. And if we could just do that, and like you say, inspire him to want to be those things. To want to, um, that can be it. That can can change the world. Amen. Preach, Margot. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.